the Dwarves. One of the toughest and most battle-hardened races in the Old World, their fortitude is second to none. But with some pretty major weaknesses, they're not without holes in their game. So we shall delve deep into the Dwarven army to learn how they operate. In this guide, I'll present the army's playstyle by what their roster dictates, as in what their strengths and weaknesses suggest about how they should be played. You don't have to play this way, but it's important to understand the army's characteristics. This guide is not specifically meant for on or offline. Now let's begin as always with the army traits, as if you need me to tell you the first one. The dwarves have a hell of a lot of armour. This makes them very tough, very robust, very hard to get rid of. Also creates a lot of problems for enemy factions who don't have cheap armour piercing units. And it makes it easy for them to simply outlast their opponent. Especially if you couple that with their high leadership. Dwarves have a ton of fighting experience, so they're not going to run away in a hurry. Mainly because they have short legs, but don't let that fool you. Their one major weakness of course is their lack of cavalry, or monsters for that matter. They don't really have any units they can flank with, which has a big impact on their playstyle. Because they don't really have any units that can go out wide and secure the edges, this leaves them with very exposed flanks. You have to work to protect these flanks to keep the front line in order, otherwise the dwarves may crumble. And somewhere in the middle, being heavily ironclad obviously makes you pretty damn slow, so the dwarven army as a whole is quite slow and immobile, making it quite difficult to move up on enemy armies and to flank them. All this lack of mobility and exposed flanks though, can be counteracted by the dwarves artillery and war machines. Masters of engineering, they've got plenty of tricks up their sleeves to even the odds. Get to know and understand all these traits, as it will serve you well to know what you can and can't get away with. Now let's delve into what these characteristics mean for the Dwarven strategies. So how do all these things come together to shape the Dwarven playstyle? Well of course they are a very defensive faction. They're typically best off holding up somewhere and letting the enemy come to them. Not to say they can't ever move up on the enemy themselves, but their slow mobility and lack of flanking units makes it very ineffective. But to truly play defensively, of course you need a fair amount of artillery. You need to be able to out-artillery the enemy because if he has more artillery than you, you can't really stay defensive and you'll be forced to move up on the enemy or take heavy casualties. And the dwarves do have plenty of artillery to choose from to deal with most situations. How much you bring can depend on the faction you're facing. If it's a faction without any artillery at all like the vampires, you don't need to bring that much, just enough to lure them over to you. It may be a better idea to spend more money on your infantry than your artillery in those situations. Against the Empire though, who has a lot of artillery themselves, you may need to bring a fair amount to try and out-artillery them. But of course, there are a lot of unpredictable variables. But once you finally do engage the enemy, this is where the Dwarf's true strength comes into play. Their infantry is some of the best in the Old World. Even the lower tier units can give higher tier units a run for their money sometimes. It's a triad of stats that make them so damn tough. High leadership, high armour and high melee defence make most of the Dwarven units very difficult to get rid of. And this is their key, their endurance. The Dwarves are very good at simply outlasting everyone else. They can fight for longer because they can stay in the fight longer with high leadership and high armour and avoid too much damage with their high melee defence. They don't need fancy offensive tactics, the Dwarves will simply fight until the enemy can't fight any longer. Maintaining order and minimising damage done to the Dwarves though can be a key to this. That means formation is extra important to the Dwarves. Like any army, your front line is very very important. It's there to move up on the enemy and provide the majority of the killing power for you. You do of course need to protect the flanks though because the enemy is looking to smash into the back of that line with infantry, cavalry or anything else. And because outlasting the enemy is what the dwarves are trying to do, you need to protect that front line with everything you have available. Units on your flanks, slayers, ranged units, artillery, all of this can help to protect the rear of the front line. Try your best to prevent any holes that the enemy may try to slip through to flank you. And as always, do your best to maintain formation. One thing dwarves can look for to try and even the odds a bit is decent terrain. High ground makes it very difficult for enemy cavalry and enemy flanking units to run up quickly and get behind you because the high ground will slow them down when they run up it. So where possible, taking advantage of any kind of defensible terrain is really useful for the dwarves. Of course though, the artillery situation will dictate whether you can stay there. It may be a better idea to abandon the terrain and push on the enemy. So all this formation and terrain talk is of course about protecting your flanks. It is the most important thing for the dwarves and one of the hardest things to do. If you're a clown bag like this guy, you'll leave your flank horrendously exposed and the enemy will just walk around and come up behind you. 
Now I have made a tactic video called Dwarf Anti-Cav, all about how to defend your flanks from the Dwarf's biggest threat, cavalry. So I suggest you go and watch that if you haven't seen it already, to save me having to repeat myself. Basically I just give you a formation and a few different tactical ideas to help you manage the enemy cavalry. It's not a foolproof plan by any means because there isn't one. It's very difficult to deal with enemy cavalry for the dwarves. But on that dwarf anti-cab video, I did get a lot of people saying they were skeptical that it would work, especially online. The tactics I mentioned in that video are a good idea however you're playing. For example, it's a good idea to protect slayers from charges, on or offline. An organ gun will shred cavalry, on or offline. Either way, I set out to try and prove my theories online. I played approximately 20 ranked battles, and you know what I found? Most people don't bring very much cavalry against the dwarves anyway. Two to three units, rarely any more. Which is a little bit strange considering how big of a weakness cavalry can be for the dwarves. So have a look at that video to learn more about defending your flanks from cavalry. And one last major notable thing to mention, the dwarves don't have a great deal of anti-large units. So focusing on large and taking down cavalry and monsters first can be a good idea. Slayers are of course your best call for taking out the large units, but they're very expensive, fragile, and they can't be everywhere at once. Missile units can be helpful, and artillery as well, and even the brimstone gun gyrocopters. But all these things can be rendered ineffective quite easily by the enemy, so focus on taking down the large, or your infantry may struggle with them. So all that combines to be the main things that the dwarfs have to think about. They are one of the easier factions to play, with their defensive playstyle and very tough infantry. And before we get into the roster, let's talk a little bit more about that infantry to make sure we understand how tough they truly are. So here we've got one of the cheaper units, Dwarf Warriors, who cost about 450, fighting three units of Empire Swordsmen, who cost 400, and they are indeed holding their own against three enemy units. Cheaper units from other factions would never be able to withstand this kind of punishment because of the huge numbers advantage of the Empire. They would be gone very quick, but Dwarfs will fight nearly to the death. And this is great for buying time because it gives you time to try and get these dwarf warriors some help from missiles, from artillery, from heroes, from other melee units. They hold that line very, very well. And they've nearly got 100 kills here, so it's not as if they're going away empty-handed. They're not going to beat these three units, of course, but they will hold them off for a good amount of time and do a significant amount of damage. And what does this all play into? Well, their value for money. Sometimes cheaper dwarf units can beat more expensive units from other factions. So it's worth taking that into account when building for your enemy, whether it's on or offline. If the opposing faction doesn't have the best infantry, you can probably afford to bring some of your cheaper infantry and it'll still be able to beat them. If you're facing someone with tougher infantry like the Chaos, you may want to invest in tougher frontline units to have the best chance of beating them. And of course, you have to be very aware of the matchups on that front line. Armor piercing units are of course a huge threat to dwarves, which means they're gonna have a good matchup on you, so you need to make sure you have a good matchup on them. As in, if they're a heavily armoured unit, you need to make sure you've got armour piercing units on your front line. If they're non-heavily armoured units, you have to make sure you've got non-armour piercing units on your front line. As we should all know, getting the right matchups is the key to victory. Now let's quickly talk about magic for the dwarves. They don't have a lot of it, especially when compared to other factions who have all sorts of spellbooks, but the dwarf runes are more than enough reason to take advantage of the magic pool. I didn't list this as a negative for the dwarves because I don't think they really need the magic. They do have that 25% magic resistance as well, so it's not really an essential part of their game plan. They do have some strong options though, the Rune of Wrath and Ruin, probably their best known spell, one of the strongest, and they've got different ones that can just tip the balance in their favour when needed. So bringing a runesmith can be very handy, but I don't think you should feel like you're missing out on something if you don't have that magic available to you. To the almighty dwarf roster then, starting with our lords. The first one is cleverly named Lord, and he is, like most factions' cheapest general, your best option if you want to save money. He's not too bad in the melee, and he'll probably outperform other factions' cheapest generals. However, he doesn't have any mounts like they do, but he does have a charge defense against all. The Rune Lord is a similar option, good if you want to save some money. If you want to bring a melee lord, but you also want some runes, but you don't want to spend the money on a melee lord and a runesmith, the Rune Lord has got you covered. He's just not as good in melee. And then there's the almighty Ungrim Iron Fist, one of the Dwarf's toughest generals, charge defense, melee expert, he's armor piercing. He also has a sneaky bonus versus large, which it doesn't tell you on the unit card, so you might not notice that. Against large unit crowds or generals on mounts, he can do pretty damn well. He has a bunch of abilities, he's also unbreakable and has a few resistances. Just a really damn tough, good value for money general. If you're facing a faction with some strong lords, Ungrim can be a damn good call. 
And that brings us to the leader of the dwarfs, Thorgrim Grudgebearer. He is extremely tough with really high hit points and a lot of melee defense. He hits pretty damn hard too, non-armor piercing though, so he's going to be good in lightly armored crowds. And he also has magical attacks. So probably a good choice to bring against lighter factions like the Beastmen or the Elves, because he can get stuck into the melee with all their infantry and do a hell of a lot of damage to them, and not take too much himself. I am going to assume he's classed as a large unit though, so be careful around anti-large units. Belagar Ironhammer is next on the list. He's kind of like a stronger Ungrim. He's a bit tougher, a bit stronger, he's got some unique abilities. He's not armor piercing though and doesn't have a bonus versus large like Ungrim. But he pretty much plays a similar role just with different targets because he's not armor piercing and not anti-large. He does have a shield as well actually which can be pretty useful so that's another thing to consider when facing a faction with a lot of missiles and stuff. As most dwarf lords don't have a shield. And last but not least the almighty Gromrindle the white dwarf. My personal favorite. He is a melee behemoth. Lots of weapon strength, it's armor piercing, magical attacks. He's got a few of his own abilities and a bunch of resistances like all these lords do. He's going to be a great choice against heavily armoured factions and especially heavily armoured enemy lords. Now the biggest downside to most of these dwarven lords is that they can't be put on any mounts, so they can be a little bit susceptible to being attacked by multiple lords and heroes and not being able to deal with that. So do be cautious and try to protect your lord as he doesn't have the luxury of a quick escape. Now to the heroes, with Thane being the first. Most factions have a cheap melee hero, the Thane is the dwarf's option. He is pretty damn tough though with his high armor, so he'll take on those other heroes and kick the crap off them. What does that even mean? And then you have your runesmith, obviously he's there to bring the runes. He's not as good in melee, but he's not bad by any means. If you want to take advantage of that magic pool, make use of Wrath of Ruin, Oath and Steel, bring yourself a runesmith. And lastly, the Master Engineer, a nice ranged hero option. He has a couple of buffs that apply to allies, so skirmishers around him or artillery. He's going to buff them up and make them even more powerful. So he can be a good call if you have a lot of them. He's also very useful to have around if the enemy has a lot of flying units or especially a flying general. Can be very hard to get hold of sometimes, so having the ability to shoot them down out of the sky with a lot of armor piercing damage, very damn useful. If you don't really have a lot of artillery or missiles though, he's probably going to be limited in his use. These reload skills, accuracy skills, kind of going to go to waste, so make sure you've got good reason to bring him. Like everything, which faction you face is really going to decide which hero you need to bring. Now for the infamous Dwarf Infantry. What better solution to fill out your army in a time of war than to send your miners into war? And with their pretty crappy stats, they're basically an expendable unit. However, they are armor piercing, which is a nice little trait to have. And a little bit strangely, they also have Vanguard deployment, which is a bit odd for a cheap expendable unit, but cool, not going to argue with that. They're also pretty good against gates, so useful in sieges. And with all that armor on, they're not completely useless like a lot of other expendable units. A cheap option for at least getting in the way of cavalry. And then you have the miners with blasting charges. All but the same as that previous unit, except they have those nasty satchels of fiery doom. Very useful for breaking up enemy charges. They could be useful on the flanks to help protect against charging cavalries to perhaps break up their formation a bit and ruin their charge. And now to the first actual plausible infantry. Dwarf warriors are not a bad unit for the amount you pay for them. As I showed earlier, they can take on similar priced units and defeat them. With their high armor and superior stats, it's very easy for them to outlast most similar priced units. They also have a charge defense and a shield, so they're a great frontline option. Then you have your dwarf warriors with great weapons. Very similar to the previous unit of course, they're just armor piercing instead, which is always a nice bonus, but it's at the expense of a few stats, their charge defense and their shield. So really an offensive unit for taking down heavily armored things. A regiment of renown now in the Ekrand miners. Pretty much the same deal as the blasting charge miners, except their melee stats aren't actually that bad. So they can throw down in melee and beat the crap out of some heavier units. Longbeards now, another fantastic unit for the price. They are essentially just an improved version of the Dwarf Warriors. Slightly higher stats, got a shield, got a charge defense. They are old grumblers as well, which means they'll buff the leadership of nearby units. Got a few other resistances and stuff. A fantastic frontline option when facing tougher enemy infantry. So if you can bring Longbeards over Dwarf Warriors, for an extra 200, you are getting a pretty good deal, I think. And then we have another regiment, the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass. They are Dwarf Warriors, slightly improved, fire on their melee attacks. They also have a bonus versus infantry, which is pretty nice. So probably a good unit to bring and to try and get them into a specific dangerous unit to you, like say war dancers, any specific lightly armored threat. Better off to give them a role than to just let them fight whoever. You don't want them wasting their health fighting goblin spearmen or something. They can be dealt with by miners or whoever. 
Longbeards with great weapons are indeed an improved version of Dwarf Warriors with great weapons, very similar, just slightly better stats of course, but these boys are especially useful for defending your flanks from heavy cavalry. They've got armor piercing and a charge defense. Also, both Longbeard units have an immunity to psychology, which can be very useful when facing the vampires and such. So like I've said, depending on your opponent, you may want to bring a higher quality front line, which pretty much comes down to either having Longbeards or Dwarf Warriors. And then you've got the Grumbling Guard, who are very much just Longbeards with great weapons, slightly improved in the stats. They've got a ton of leadership and melee defense, means they could be a great holding unit. If a hole appears in your front line, you can send them in and they'll fill it and keep it filled for a long time. They also have a slight buff to their vigor, which is again just going to help them outlast their opponents. They can be good to go after the enemy's strongest heavily armored units like Chosen or Black Orcs. They may not beat them necessarily in a one on one, but they will wear them down to the point where they're going to be nearly useless. Onto your main anti-large option, the Slayers. Of course, anything large, these boys should be trying to get after it. Cavalry, monsters, whatever. They have the anti-large bonus, so they do plenty of damage against those large foes. They're just an overall great damage dealing unit. They are quite fragile though, because they have no armor. So do try to protect them from getting shot by missiles or charged by cavalry, because the sooner they die, the less effective they're gonna be. They are unbreakable, of course, so they're not gonna run away, but they're too expensive to be careless with. They'll actually do pretty well against light infantry as well, if they have nothing else to do. And then one of the best armor piercing units the dwarves have available, the Hammerers. Fantastic damage dealing unit. They don't have the highest melee defense, so they do take a fair amount of damage, but they deal out a hell of a lot to heavily armored foes. They're not really a great frontline unit though because of that lower melee defense, but a couple of units scattered in your army just ready to deal with the enemy's best heavy armor units, they can be really damn powerful. They are very expensive though, so they can only really be used as a frontline in campaign. And if they are, your army's gonna have to be pretty offensive. But if you want a front line that is basically just a wall that cannot be moved, then Iron Breakers are the way to go, of course, in campaign. They really are the epitome of the Dwarven tactics, high leadership, high armor, ridiculous amounts of melee defense. They are not going anywhere, basically. They also have that ranged weapon, much like the Miners, just an explosive satchel, great for disrupting those charges, although they do have a charge defense against all, so charge bonuses mean nothing against the Iron Breakers. Their downside though is they don't really do a lot of damage. Average melee attack and weapon strength means they're going to be better at doing damage over a long period of time and simply outlasting their opponent. It is non-armor piercing damage as well, so going to be best used against lighter factions. Now Dragonback Slayers, very much the same as the regular Slayers. They have a fair amount more melee attack and they also have this trait which reduces the enemy's speed by 36%. Great for stopping cavalry from getting away from them. They can do a lot of damage while the cavalry is trying to get away. They've slowed them down. Also reduces their flame resistance. So it could be great against regenerating units. They also have a bunch of resistances and everything else. So worth the extra money if you're facing a faction with some great monsters and especially cavalries. Norgrimling's Iron Breakers. Very much your regular Iron Breakers, just slightly in tougher. They've got 96 leadership, which is insane. Makes them nearly unbreakable, essentially. More melee attacks, so they'll do a bit more damage, but they're generally just going to serve the same purpose as regular Iron Breakers. They do strangely have Vanguard deployment, which I'm not really sure how much use that's going to be for a unit that has 26 speed. It's also worth noting that their unit size is actually 20 dwarfs stronger than the regular Iron Breakers. This is just going to add to their toughness and make them last even longer. Peak Gate Guard are our final unit. Compared to the Hammerers, they are of course just an improved version. But they do have Armor Sundering, which is a pretty cool trait as not many units have it. It reduces the armor of whoever they're fighting. So pit them against Black Orcs, Chosen, Great Swords, whoever is heavily armored, and they'll reduce their armor and make them slightly easier to kill. They also have Magical Attacks, which is great for helping negate those physical resistances. But really, the same sort of use as the regular Hammerers. So the Dwarf Infantry Sector has a lot to choose from. You can get pretty creative with your setups, just be sure to make use of all those charge defense units to help protect yourself from cavalry. Onto our ranged units, and rangers are the first option. The first thing you might notice is they do have a lack of armor compared to all other dwarf units, but this allows them to be a bit quicker on their feet, which makes them great for flanking and great for being a vanguard unit. Couple that with stalk and you can launch some pretty sneaky ambushes. And then you've got one of your mainline missile units, the quarrelers. Good range and damage just like the rangers, They've got a ton of armor, which means most lightly armored missiles won't be able to take them on in a one-on-one -on -one skirmish. Really your best bet against lightly armored factions. Rangers with great weapons, very much the same as the regular rangers, just they're better for dealing with armor piercing units. They have much shorter range though, as they throw axes instead of firing missiles, but they can be fantastic for sneaking up on a heavily armored unit and doing a lot of damage quickly. 
Then we have our Quarrelers with great weapons, very much the same as the regular Quarrelers. They're actually pretty good in melee, the Quarreler units, and this one has great weapons so they are armor piercing in melee. Only in melee though, their ranged missiles are not armor piercing. So probably the better choice against heavier factions, although they are slightly more expensive than the regular Quarrelers. And it's good to remember that crossbow units fire in an arc, so they're better at firing over things. And then we have the ever dangerous Thunderers, one of the better missile units in the game. They're armor piercing, they have a lot of armor. They can do a hell of a lot of damage to large heavy armor targets or just heavily armored units in general. They do fire in pretty much a straight line though rather than an arc. So do be careful of being obstructed by your units or any kind of terrain. I find that they're a fantastic unit for shooting down heavily armored enemy generals on mounts, griffins, zombie dragons. Thunderers will chew through their armor very quickly. Onto Bugman's Rangers, who are pretty much the same as the regular Rangers, I don't really understand what they're for. They have a few different traits like replenishment, which is that really useful for a missile unit? I'm not too sure. They've got immunity to psychology, but otherwise they are very much the same as the regular Rangers. A bit better in melee, but otherwise I'm not really sure of their purpose. Ulthar's Raiders, again same thing, very similar to the Rangers with great weapons, slightly better in most areas. They do have a Hex which will reduce some stats of the enemy so it's going to help do more damage to them. But really most of these Vanguard Stalk units I think need a good plan in place to make the most of them. And you have to be careful of the map because some maps they'll be kind of useless on and other ones they'll be perfect for. So if you've generally got quite a strong ambush game then these units will be really interesting and you can get pretty creative with them because they are kind of outside the Dwarves main playstyle. Which is good because it means you can mix things up a bit. On to the Iron Drakes, awesome units. Flamethrower Iron Drakes are the first one. They basically just melt light infantry like there's no tomorrow. They don't have a great deal of range and they're not so good against armor. But like I said, lightly armored infantry will get burnt to a crisp by these boys. They can be quite hard to protect though, so you do have to keep an eye on them and make sure they don't get charged into by cavalry or infantry or flying units because they can be easily neutralized by the enemy potentially. That fire damage also really useful against regenerating and wood units. Then there's a troll hammer torpedo variation, pretty much the same sort of deal, it's just that they're armor piercing and anti-large. Heavily armored cavalry can be a great target for them because they'll absolutely destroy them. Large monsters with little armor though, like a giant for example, may not be the best target for them as they are armor piercing, but it'll still do a great amount of damage because it is anti-large. Again though, protecting them can be the problem. And then we have the Skulder Guard Iron Drakes, who are indeed pretty much the same as the flamethrower ones. Except instead of a flamethrower, they have a steam cannon type thing, which is armor piercing. So great for those heavily armored units. So which faction you're facing should dictate which one you might want to bring. These units are of course very expensive though, so you probably won't want to bring any more than one of them. And that is the Dwarf Missile Core. Again, much like the infantry, you've got lots of options, lots of different ways you could play it. I'd say Thunderers are one of the essentials. One or two units of Thunderers should probably be in pretty much every army. But experiment with it, you've got some options to play with. Artillery time then, and again we've got many an option. First up is the Bolt Thrower. It has pretty good range with armor piercing missiles, and it is classed apparently as anti-large. It doesn't have any damage bonus, but it is pretty accurate. So when firing at giants or griffins, it will hit them most of the time. Then you've got your bread and butter of artillery, the Grudge Thrower. Armor piercing missiles, but great against heavy or light infantry. It's cheap price and great range, I mean it's probably one you want to bring to most battles, especially if you plan on playing defensively. Now to a Dwarf Air option with the Gyrocopters, one of the few units that you can kind of flank with. It's going to serve you best against light infantry with its ranged attacks, as most of its damage is non-armor piercing. It does have the bombs that can be dropped also, but again, they are non-armor piercing damage. So against large numbers of lightly armored troops like the Beastmen or the Greenskins, the Gyrocopters will do a fair amount of damage, firing and bombing into lightly armored crowds. And back to the non-air war machines, you've got your cannon. Great range like the Grudge Thrower, but it is better against larger targets because it is quite accurate and does armor piercing damage. Flying units may be a good target for the cannon as they are generally heavily armored. A lot of large land units like Giants or Arachnoroks or Vargolfs don't really have a lot of armor, so the armor piercing is kind of negated. But in all fairness, whatever you fire the cannon at, it's going to do a fair amount of damage, even infantry. Then you've got your Brimstone Gun Gyrocopters, pretty much the same sort of deal as the previous one, it's just they are anti-large and they have armor piercing missiles. I find them to be pretty effective against heavily armored cavalries who can't fight back. It's also worth mentioning that gyrocopters have absolutely abysmal melee defense. Do not put them in melee unless you absolutely have no other choice. They can be good for charging in like a shock cavalry just to get a morale penalty, charging in the rear of an enemy, but other than that, avoid melee at all costs. The Goblobber, very much the same as the Grudge Thrower, except it basically fires goblins at your enemy, which is always a good idea. 
Its big trait though is that it reduces the enemy's leadership by 16, which is quite a big amount. Now, this isn't going to be much use for an approaching army, I don't think, because as soon as you hit them, after 10 seconds, that leadership debuff is going to go away. But where this thing can really shine is firing at routed units. A routed unit needs its leadership to go back up so it can come back to the fight. If you don't allow its leadership to go back up by firing at it with this thing, you can keep them from the fight and maybe even run them off the map. So it can be damn useful in the right situation. And then we've got one of my personal favourite artilleries, the Organ Gun. I find this thing absolutely shreds cavalry to pieces, no matter what cavalry they are, how much armour they've got, the armour pissing missiles of the Organ Gun do not care. They're pretty accurate so it will rack up a lot of damage very quickly, although it does have a significantly shorter range than other artillery. My personal favourite against lots of enemy cavalry. Then there's another gyrocopter type with the gyro bomber. Pretty much the same sort of deal as the previous two but it does quite a bit more damage and that damage is armour piercing. So this one's designed to be anti-heavy infantry more than anything else. It also has the bombs like the other two so they can be quite versatile and give you some kind of air advantage. The trouble with gyrocopter seems to be though, even with 100 armour, they don't take missile damage very well and god knows they can't even beat a flock of pigeons in a melee fight because of their terrible melee defence, so you do have to keep an eye on them and make sure they're safe most of the time. The flame cannon's pretty much what you'd expect, it fires fireballs at your enemy. It doesn't have very much range and doesn't do armour piercing damage, so it's best fired into lightly armoured crowds where possible. Given its poor range though, it doesn't have a lot of time to really do its damage, so I don't think it's worth the money. You could probably do more damage, spending the money on a different artillery. And last but not least, the Sky Bomber. This thing is pretty much just designed to bomb the crap out of crowds. So again, factions with lots of numbers, beastmen, greenskins, they're trying to overrun you, you get them all bunched up, bring this thing along and drop some bombs on it, game over for their leadership. And a lot of their lives. It also has a pretty strong ranged attack, which is armour piercing. So this thing can do a lot for you, but it is quite expensive of course. And that my friends, is the Dwarf roster. They don't have a lot of sections, it's only infantry, missiles and artillery, but they do have a lot of options within those sections, which I think makes them quite simple to play and kind of limited, but at the same time, there are many different avenues in which you can take to play. Now to a quick example battle then, I've got my Dwarven army here, we are ready to go, there's some chaos coming our way, infantry, monsters, cavalry, I've set up on the hill a little bit, to try and gain that terrain advantage, I've got some artillery firing on them to draw them into me so they don't just sit there or wait for me to come to them. I've got some brimstone gyrocopters firing on their cavalry. I'm going to try and whittle them down as cavalry are a big threat to me. Lots of armour piercing infantry coming towards the centre. Lots of great weapons, there's some chosen in there, some trolls, kolek, all the right ingredients to take down a dwarf army. So what I'm going to need to do here is try to control my flanks, not let them get behind me and hope to outlast their infantry as much as we can. I've got my grudge thrower firing on a very dangerous unit, the chosen with great weapons, they're going to be a hard force to stop, so we're going to get them whittled down with the grudge thrower, and then whoever deals with them should have an easier time with them, hopefully, but they are very tough. A couple of hits there, knocked a little bit of their health off, even with a few hits from the grudge thrower they don't lose too much health, because they are that freaking tough. So I've got to try and protect my flanks here, I'm using my organ gun and my slayers, got to put some of my slayers in the centre though because it looks like there's trolls charging towards it and kolek. So I need to try and deter them and get rid of them. They are approaching because my front line isn't really equipped to deal with large units. This cavalry is getting slaughtered by my brimstone guns and organ gun. Focusing on them, trying to get them down so we have one less unit of cavalry to worry about. There is a Gorby's Chariot on that side as well. We've got one of these Chaos Knight units wavering. We've got Thunderers firing at them too. Chariots are coming in on the other side and are about to charge in. Looks like they're going to hit me in the flank. Got some Slayers at the ready. Don't want to let them get charged though. Oh, they pulled a cheeky. They've hit one of my front units inside. We'll get the slayers on them though. My deep formation on the right has prevented the chariot from charging through, so we've got them tied up for now. In come the slayers for them. Trolls at the front, sending the dragon backs in. Got to get rid of them with the anti-large because that infantry at the front can't deal with trolls very well. Start to fire my artillery on Kolek because he's a big target and he's going to stand there like that. I'm going to shoot him. The chavalry on the right. Chavalry? Is that chavs on horses? Imagine that. The chariot on the right has gone away. The front lines are all but engaged now. Trying to hold off the cavalry on the left side. My slayers are still pursuing them. Got them down to half health. But so far my front line is held pretty strong. We've got no holes in our line. Considering that most of these front line units were dwarf warriors with great weapons. With a few long beards with great weapons thrown into the mix. We're doing pretty damn well. See I've got two units here holding off about five. I just supported them with my gyrocopters. Dropped some bombs. You can see a bit of wavering going on there now. Trolls are going away. I just cast Wrath and Ruin on them as my general is a rune lord. 
He's going after Kolek though because he has Cojones holding off these right flanking units even though they could come straight around behind us but this is the AI for you. Gonna get my Thunders ready to fire on them when they try to come round, routing the other cavalry. More and more wavering from the enemy's front line. kolex has gone as well, I've got the Brimstone guns on him. But you can see these Dwarf Warriors, even though they are far inferior to the Chaos Warriors with great weapons because they are far cheaper and their stats are less, they're holding so well because that's what the Dwarfs do best. I've managed to protect most of the back of my front line and as I said, this is the AI, they're not the smartest in the world, human players will be tougher. Cavalry and things though can take a lot of damage and get stuck and even die if they charge carelessly behind the enemy front lines and just get themselves pinned in by slayers or whatever so it's not as if charging behind the enemy lines is always the best idea but we're routing a lot of these frontline units now we've managed to defeat them I've dropped more bombs I've got some charges in with the old gyrocopters just helping to reduce their leadership and get rid of them so my boys have outlasted theirs leadership wise so we've managed to scare most of them off I'm going to start to fire on them with my artillery here Colex come back dragon back slayers will sort him down though here comes the slowest score beast charge ever what is that about is that the granddad Gorby's chariot, which is really old and slow? We've done it though, we've held our high ground and repelled the chaos. So there you go my friends, the dwarfs in all their magnificent bearded glory. And if you're new to the Total War franchise, you may find the dwarfs a good faction to start with. However, don't take their playstyle as the be all and end all of how Total War is meant to be played. They have a different style because they don't have any cavalry and they have more armor than everyone else, which makes them fairly easy to play. Just be sure to not get used to that, necessarily. Of course, I will be covering the final two factions that I haven't done yet, so please don't say in the comments and tell me to do the other factions, because yes, I will do them. So if anyone doesn't watch this part of the video and does comment telling me to do a Greenskins or Chaos Guide, I want everyone else who sees that comment to call that person a schlonghead. And on that note, I hope you've enjoyed this, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the future, laddies.